Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Wednesday video. This week, as you might have guessed, hopefully from the title, we're going to be discussing one very particular battle cruiser, and one that I know uh, quite a few of you who have uh, watched things like the Jutland uh, series that I've done have come to know and love quite well, which is, of course, HMS New Zealand. Uh, and to do that, we're joined today uh, by the wonderful Matthew Wright, who has recently uh, published a book all about HMS New Zealand. So who better to talk to <laughs> about the the uh, battle cruiser? So welcome, uh, welcome to the channel. Uh, would you like to just let everyone know who you are and what you do? Thank you. Yeah, well, look, I'm Matthew Wright. Um, I'm a qualified professional historian. I've got multiple degrees in the subject. Um, I've written very extensively on military history, uh, specialised in naval. Um, and uh, yes, the, the story of HMS New Zealand is something that I've been looking at on and off for many, many years. So it was, it was very good to be able to bring it together into a book. And we will obviously be telling everyone where you can find the book of what it's called towards the end of the video, but uh, spoilers for later. So I guess we'll lead in with uh, question one, which is why on earth in the early 1900s was New Zealand, which at the time was a relatively small colony of well, about a million people, interested in buying a full on capital warship for the Royal Navy. Yeah, well, I, this is something that falls into uh, what could best be called imperial politics uh, and the, the kind of society of the day. Um, you know, a, a hundred, 110 years ago, was a very different society from today. We, we, we look back, they shared a language with us, they shared buildings and, you know, that we can still see. Um, but, but the culture was actually quite subtly different in, in many ways. And what had happened was that um, Britain was at the very pinnacle of its imperial power through this period, 1890s through into the early 1900s. Um, Australasia was seen as a strategic unit by the Admiralty. Um, Australasian politics, however, had gone through something of an evolution because in the late 19th century, there was uh, seven Australasian colonies and they were all much of a muchness in terms of scale and power. Uh, New South Wales was fairly, probably preeminent at the point. Victoria, those, you know, and you had New Zealand out further east, uh, which was at that time an evolving settler society. Um, and then in 1900, the Commonwealth of Australia was formed and uh, New Zealand was invited to join. And, and I believe that to this very day, the Australian constitution has facility for New Zealand to become part of Australia. Um, and uh, New Zealand didn't. And um, the reasons why it didn't have quite a bit to do with the gift and why New Zealand made such a, a, a very expensive uh, gesture to its parent. Um, to understand that, we then have to think back about New Zealand society at the time. Um, New Zealand had been a colonial society. People had come out to it from Britain primarily um, from the 1840s with ambition to have a bigger or better Britain, uh, to build this, this colossally important South Pacific nation. I mean, there were even suggestions that, you know, African animals should be imported. The place should have elephants in it. And yeah, seriously, <laughs> and, uh, you know, this sort of thing. So, you know, very ambitious. Didn't come to pass. And instead, in the 1870s, the government initiated a pretty major program of continuing to colonise. So state subsidised colonisation. Um, by mythology, these came from Scandinavia, but in fact, most of them were from the area around the Witchwood, actually, in, in Britain, Cornwall, Scotland. Um, and they came out in very significant numbers through into the 1880s. So that New Zealand, as it got into the 1890s, felt itself very much a colony of Britain because there were so many people in it who had been born in Britain. So it was it was a new thing. Um, and this this whole idea of Britain being home uh, emerged from that time because Britain was home. 
So, and this differed from Australia, which hadn't had that colonization. So Australia was becoming more of a vision of itself as a, a South Pacific entity, uh, obviously within the British ambit, but with its own identity. New Zealand didn't share that. And this is really important to understanding the gift. Um, so you had uh, two Austral Australasian colonies. Uh, the bigger one was becoming more and more independent, more self-aware of its vulnerabilities in the South Pacific as in terms of defence. Uh, you had New Zealand, which leaned towards Britain, which viewed itself as a colony, but which for its own reasons and its, you know, its New Zealand character and something which we probably still do, uh, had to be the best of the colonies. It had to be Britain's best child. And, uh, you know, so it, it, it was supported by another factor that made it possible to make this gift. Um, exporting frozen sheep, uh, among <laughs> other things. The dairy industry grew up at this time. Refrigeration made all of this possible. And so there was material being sold back to Britain in increasing quantity and with increasing prosperity. Um, so you've got New Zealand looking to Britain, sharing Australia's vulnerabilities in terms of its defence thinking. And, and the idea was that the Russians were going to come tearing south from Vladivostok uh, and take over New Zealand. Uh, how <laughs> this would happen was never made clear, but that was what they <laughs> believed, you know, public belief can't sway that, you know, we know where these things go now with, with social media, um, and widespread fear of the Russians. Turn of the century, Russo-Japanese War 1904-05, that all changed, and overnight, with mainly the Battle of Tsushima, but also the land battles uh, on, the, on the Korean Peninsula, um, Russia disappeared and was immediately replaced by Japan as the next enemy. Uh, as far as New Zealand and Australia were concerned, um, the problem, of course, being that Japan was allied to Britain. This was really embarrassing. And, and so uh, you've got this diverging defence perception going on between Australia and New Zealand and also between Australasia and Britain. Um, at this time, New Zealand's belief was, you know, best loyal child and everything, that the best way to protect New Zealand was to strengthen the Royal Navy from the centre. Australia, which it was following some of the other um, dominions of the day in doing so, thought that it was better to have local defence under local control and was pushing for a small navy within the ambit of empire. Um, the Admiralty didn't like any of it, um, particularly under Admiral Fisher, who was a pretty autocratic, shall we say, um, um, actually completely autocratic, I think would probably be the better way of describing it. But the Admiralty in any case, as a general institution, didn't want local navies because it interfered with their ability to control all of these ships. So you've got a situation that's emerging in the first years of the 20th century where New Zealand has one idea about imperial defence, Australia has another, and the Australian idea was fuelled in part because they could afford it. Um, New Zealand pretty much couldn't, and Britain had a different idea again. Um, and that was, there was a certain tension going on there. And then in the middle of it, of course, you've got the Dreadnought Revolution occurs, which, as I looked into in the book, um, wasn't necessarily the, the, the sort of guillotine-like shift that one would believe uh, today, but which did influence public opinion. And once again, the public opinion was what was the driving factor with a lot of this. Um, you've got the arms race developing with Germany, and in particular, it's in the public mind, it became focused around numbers of dreadnoughts. And, you know, it was a quite simplistic reduction, but it was one that became the defining factor. And it was discussed even here in New Zealand. I mean, I, I looked up for the book, I looked up um, newspapers from small rural regions 
and they were discussing it. So it was it was something that was a very, very public matter. Um, and to an extent, the Admiralty bought into it. Um, Fisher, who uh, wasn't merely an autocrat, but had a certain paranoia about him, uh, believed the Germans were deceiving them over the number of ships to be built. The Germans, of course, had their fleet law, which um, ostensibly controlled the scale of the fleet. And it was very disingenuous because by tweaking the fleet law, they could actually alter the fleet's strength quite significantly, um, all the while hiding behind the fact that, that you know, the law allowed them to, to do this. So by 1908, things were getting set up for a public panic uh, in that sense. And this occurred with uh, a general belief, including in admiralty circles, that the Germans had secretly accelerated their building programs, that Britain's building programs, which had been suffering heavily under the Liberal government, which was cutting defence spending um, and keeping the numbers of capital ships built low, below that recommended in the 1905 memorandum, um, you ended up in a situation where there was suddenly a public panic. It was politicised. It became very much um, a political and public issue, not to do with, with uh, the actual strategic position. Um, and that was the backdrop to what then followed. But to understand you know, why this gift was made, what this gift was about, we've got to go back to New Zealand and Australia, where New Zealand had been working pretty hard to undermine everything Australia was doing in terms of its own local fleet. Um, in 1907, there was a colonial conference, as they called it then, which was the get together of all of Britain's main colonies and dominions, uh, at which the Australians had managed to get a very grudging uh, acceptance that they could have a local fleet. The Admiralty then dragged the chain phenomenally uh, to the point where they got into an argument with the colonial office and were threatening each other with lawyers. Uh, it, was, it was quite hilarious, you know, the whole thing was political. New Zealand was in a really difficult position. The Prime Minister, uh, Joseph Ward, had decided that the country officially couldn't afford any more naval defence. They were making a contribution to the Royal Navy financially, and that was it. And anything else, all they could do was supply coal or manpower. Um, suddenly, as soon as the Australians looked like they were getting their fleet, he increased the naval subsidy unilaterally to £100,000, which at the time was a phenomenal amount of money. Uh, this had to come out of government cash flow, but they did have the cash flows to do that. Um, so the politics are quite clear. So that was the backdrop to the point where this naval panic erupted. And at that moment, things got rather complex because the idea arose early in 1909, in uh, early March, that in Australia, as a public thought, maybe Australia should just give a dreadnought to Britain to, to resolve its uh, alleged weakness. And um, this really undermined Joseph Ward because it meant that he, ha he would have had no munitions left, as it were, in the political battle uh, were that dreadnought offer to be made. And this was on a, a Friday in March. So on the Saturday, he sat down, he wrote a paper for his own cabinet offering, suggesting that they should approve an offer of one or two dreadnoughts. The offer was considered the following Monday and Ward immediately made that offer. Uh, and this was specifically to undermine any possible Australian offer. Mm -hmm. um, the reasons why Ward did it, however, were nothing to do with patriotism in the Australian sense of the offer but more to do with this imperial structure that he was imagining with New Zealand contributing to the centre. And he thought all the Britain's children should contribute to the centre. And this was New Zealand taking the lead. And he, he was playing the patriotic card, but beneath that was this, this heavy duty politics. Um, they'd argued this one before. New Zealand was described as a, a, a voice of one when doing so. 
and so the offer was made in that context in New Zealand, but it was received purely as a patriotic gesture everywhere else. Um, so that's why it was made. It was entirely political. It was entirely to put one over the Australians. Um, <laughs> and it didn't go down very well at all. It was accepted wonderfully as a wonderful patriotic gift of the sort of, yes, well, thank you very much. Um, and that was about it. It didn't stop the Australians from pursuing the naval, uh, one na the, the local navy. Canada briefly thought about having a dreadnought offer and then went and approved its own local navy. Um, so New Zealand ended up having made this rather expensive gesture without achieving any of the political aims that, that Ward had done, but they were committed. Uh, and because he'd done it without calling Parliament, uh, he was very severely wrapped over the knuckles for doing that. Um, Parliament took the attitude that, yes, yes, of course we're going to give a dreadnought, but you could have asked us first. <laughs> so, you know, so that's basically the story behind it. Uh, a little yeah. extended yeah. there, but it's a complex story, and it's one that isn't often told. Yeah, oh, I suppose the, the, the obvious question there is, you know, New Zealand's offering one or two first-class dreadnought battleships, but of course New Zealand ends up being an indefatigable class battle cruiser, albeit with a few adjustments over indefatigable herself. So how on earth did first-class dreadnought battleship get turned into battle cruiser <laughs> in the translation? Yeah, now this is this is actually another very interesting story. There's an awful lot of mythology wrapped up around this, and you see it in a lot of the secondary literature, the um, uh, there's an information gap, and it's been filled by assumption, by, uh, in some case, absolute fabrication. Um, the assumption that New Zealand, being a small nation of about a million people at the time, is a little under, but not any meaningful amount less, you know, somehow it couldn't afford to buy a battleship. So I actually looked into this for the book in very considerable detail. Um, Government debt management is the key word here. What happened uh, was that the New Zealand government at the time, and, and for some time prior, had been involved in a huge program of infrastructure development. In telegraph, roads, railway, um, massive engineering projects. And by any even world standards, these were enormous. Um, New Zealand... North Island has very rugged terrain through it. Uh, putting a railway line through it, which they intended to do, was both challenging and expensive and stretched what could be done with uh, steel technology of the day in terms of scale of viaducts, length of viaducts, um, gradients on the railway, this sort of thing. None of it was cheap. Uh, and there were other lines going in around the place into equally rugged terrain. Um, along with uh, harbour works to support the growing export industry. Uh, all of these were phenomenally expensive. And at the time, the New Zealand government was involved in uh, a major debt management program to borrow the capital needed for it on the basis that the increased prosperity that was coming, which it was, they were in a rising economy at the time, would allow this to be paid off in due course. Uh, and it was all well thought through. It was, uh, money was set aside for repayments in what they called sinking funds. Uh, this money was then reinvested back into the economy. So the whole thing became a huge fiscal impulse, uh, which in effect paid for itself through growing prosperity. Now, it's often said about HMS New Zealand that, you know, New Zealand was so poor and small it had to take out a loan for the battle cruiser. The fact was that large loans were just the way it was done. And in fact, every nation did it for all their major capital works. Um, so when the time came to authorise HMS New Zealand by statute at the end of 1909, it was done by authorising a loan and a sinking fund. Um, I had a look at the numbers and the government, as far as they were concerned uh, financially, 
all they had to worry about was the maintenance cost on the debt. Because the capital payment would look after itself through the sinking fund. And so the, the, all they had to con concern themselves about in terms of affordability was whether government cash flow could cover off the debt. They were already doing this to an enormous extent for the other capital works. And HMS New Zealand was actually a drop in the bucket. Um, for the period of her construction, uh, they authorised up to £2 million to be borrowed. Um, this amounted to a growth of only about 12% in the national debt over the same period. Uh, only about 12% of what else was borrowed over the period and a 0.66% increase in the call on government funds to support it. So it was an absolutely minuscule amount as far as the New Zealand government was concerned. Uh, they ended up getting a battle cruiser that was cheap, relatively speaking, but they could have afforded the first class dreadnought and a second one without any problem. And this, this is clear. Um, so that was how it happened. So the government borrowed this money. Um, finance was not a constraint or a consideration in terms of the choice of ship. Um, I've actually seen that in secondary literature. There's been suggestion that, you know, perhaps New Zealand had to buy a battle cruiser because it was cheaper. No, that's not the case. Um, I actually found out why HMS New Zealand was a battle cruiser. And uh, the answer is quite straightforward. Uh, I can sum it up in two words, Admiral Fisher. Um, mm -hmm. Once again, the autocrat stepped in. Um, the politics of the various dreadnought offers, Australia made a dreadnought offer separate from its Navy to placate public opinion later in 1909. And at that point, the colonial office called a specific conference in London, now known as the Imperial Defence Conference, specifically to discuss naval defence and sort out what to do with these offers. Um, everyone sent second rate, second tier officials to it, except New Zealand who sent the Prime Minister. Well, he went, uh, he wasn't going to let anyone else go. Um, he was absolutely lampooned for it. But um, they all assembled up in uh, London and proceeded to discuss what was happening. And what happened was that they were confronted by Fisher with a plan for what he called fleet units, um, built around a battle cruiser with supporting cruisers and submarines and light ships. Um, and his idea was that the Australian Navy would become one fleet unit. There would be a second fleet unit in Hong Kong, which would include the New Zealand contribution. And during the conference, he then had the idea, because this was an evolving concept of his, that they could all combine to, to become a new Pacific fleet um, in due course. Now, this came at the time when the Fisher-Beresford feud had basically exploded uh, and there was an official investigation at Beresford's pressure into whether Fisher had been in dereliction of his defence duties by withdrawing ships from overseas stations. So there was a lot of politics behind his intent to put a force into Hong Kong. Um, as for why he chose battle cruisers, well, he did like them. He had been unable to get any battle cruisers built through uh, since the initial trio. He'd been turned down every financial year since, with the exception of 1908, where he got one, which was indefatigable, and the 1909 program, where he got one more, which was Lion. Um, and there's pretty good evidence that Fisher viewed battle cruisers as superior ships. He had a quite fascination with speed. Um, from an engineering point of view, it seems that he didn't view the thing as a trade-off between speed, armour or uh, firepower. And of course, as we know, you know, with any chip design, there are many, many more considerations than just that in terms of 
meeting the specified characteristic of a uh, Board of Admiralty specification. Um, but he did like the idea of ships with uh, good speed and ships able to with a, have a decisive punch. So if the only way he could get them was through the uh, battle cruiser, then that's where he went. Um, and I've discussed in the book, there's some pretty good evidence as to what his thinking was uh, throughout that period. So he pushed for battle cruisers. The question is not actually why they were battle cruisers, but why the lion type wasn't chosen. Um, why did New Zealand and Australia end up buying what amounted to an obsolete ship? Um, at the time of this conference, the Lion had already been designed, massively powerful warship for the day, much thicker armour than an indefatigable, um, quite effective, very fast, and with 13.5 with inch guns, which were a complete revolution. Um, you know, if you're looking for a, you know, revolution in ship power, you've got to look to the step to the 13.5 inch, perhaps more than, than the advent of Dreadnought herself. Uh, really big step up in power. So why didn't Australia and New Zealand get them? And uh, the answer, as far as I can tell, was politics. Uh, the Australians were getting their Navy in a very grudging manner. And uh, to allow them to have the most powerful warship then in design anywhere in the world uh, wasn't going to be a starter. Uh, and there was also the, the fact that while Australia viewed Japan as the next potential enemy, they were still allied to Britain. And for Britain to then provide Australia with an enormously powerful warship simply wasn't going to happen politically. So for all these reasons, um, along with the fact that Britain traditionally had put second-rate ships into distant overseas stations, uh, they went for the indefatigable type. Um, there's also some secondary evidence to suggest that the gun manufacturer and gun mounting manufacturer may have been an issue. Um, you know, at this time, 13.5 inch was just being introduced. It required a whole new type of mounting, all of which had to be drawn by hand. And if you wanted a copy, that had to be drawn by hand, and it all took time. Uh, Plants had to be tooled up and uh, to do so and to then build them. Whereas they were all well set up to build the, uh, I think it was Mark 12, no, Mark, just doing this offhand, uh, the 12 inch mountings that uh, were fitted to the indefatigables. Um, so I think there were a whole raft of different reasons and that it basically ended up that uh, that was why the ship was built as it was. Yeah, a lot of people seem to forget just because a battle cruiser is obviously these days a slightly tainted concept and has been uh, because it's a battle cruiser, not a battleship. They seem to think for some reason they cost less when in fact, I mean, Colossus, the Colossus class battleships of 1910 cost about about the same, give or take a few tens of thousands as a indefatigable class. But the. Um, uh, the earlier classes of battleships are actually a little bit cheaper than a battle cruiser yeah, of yeah. all things. So, oh. um, and I know we've 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 covered. Uh, I think we've covered the how how New Zealand's actually affording this in the first place via via a loan, but it's not kind of it's not a bank breaking or unusual thing, um, which I guess brings us to uh, another I guess rather common set of myths that surround the ship. Were there any particular stipulations put on its use, such as, you know, we're giving you this ship, but it's got to stay or we really would like it to stay in New Zealand waters to to defend us um, in a way similar to how HMS Australia, obviously under Australian control, was going to stay there? Uh, there were absolutely no restrictions given. It was an outright gift and stated so explicitly. And um, that was, uh, uh, in effect, tested by Churchill um, uh, in 1912. But, the, yeah, there's been some quite heavy mythology around this, including the suggestion that the ship had been built for local service and then by some ridiculous oversight, the government suddenly realised they couldn't support it. Um, now, this is a persistent myth. I've seen it repeated in a number of secondary books, including, you know, specialist uh, engineering accounts. And I, I 
I think I've traced where it came from originally, uh, and there's just no basis at all to that mythology. Um, at other times, it's been suggested that the ship came out in 1913 for service in the Pacific, but was then recalled for the First World War. That is not true either. Um, the story is actually a lot more interesting than that. But in terms of the the um, where the ship was going to serve, the New Zealand government repeatedly stated they had no objection to it being put wherever Britain wanted it, which meant they agreed to the fleet unit. Mm -hmm. However, uh, what it did mean by accepting that was that New Zealand suddenly had no local defence, no, no ships at all in local waters, uh, other than any Australia, you know, any Royal Australian Navy ships that should happen to turn up. So that the uh, Prime Minister Ward actually negotiated to get a couple of cruisers and submarines from that fleet unit to be stationed in New Zealand waters. Um, that didn't happen either. And then in 1912, uh, Winston Churchill decided to scrap the entire fleet unit proposal in any event and bring all of the heavy ships into North Sea waters. Um, and this was part of a money saving effort that he made, thinking he could reduce the number of capital ships that year uh, by securing the two, um, what he called colonial dreadnoughts. In the event, he only got HMS New Zealand. The Australian government did have control over HMAS Australia and wouldn't let it go. So, <laughs> So that was how HMS New Zealand ended up on completion, joining the first battle cruiser squadron at the end of 1912. Which, which I suppose, yeah, that then it, it brings up the question. So she's joined first battle cruiser squadron, and you got a couple of years before World War One breaks out, or at least the best part of them. So what does she actually do between joining first battle cruiser squadron on commissioning and the outbreak of war? Now, this was quite interesting because it was something absolutely unique to that time in the Dreadnought era. Um, she went on a world tour and uh, as an independent ship. Now, um, First Captain Lionel Halsey was given her as an independent command. She was detached from the first battle cruiser squadron for the purpose in early 1913. Um, it's often... The journey is often portrayed as a thank you visit to New Zealand, which it was, but the ship was actually showing the flag globally and in particular in South America, uh, where Britain had particular interests, certainly for the nitrates that were part of the munitions industry. So there was a good reason to develop goodwill uh, there was potential sales potential there for uh, many of their firms because of the uh, South American dreadnought race that was developing at the time. So there were a whole lot of reasons to do this. And it was the first circumnavigation of the globe by any dreadnought type warship. And it was HMS New Zealand that did it. Um, and the whole of the load of doing this, and a lot of the organisation fell on Halsey, who had reasonable latitude to act as long as he met certain waypoints. Um, and so off they went. And uh, I covered that off again in the book. It was an extraordinary journey. Um, and one more reminiscent of, you know, the independent frigates of the day, days of sail. I mean, it was, it was very much of that ilk. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, of course, during this period, she does obviously arrive in New Zealand itself um, and understandably she, she and her crew receive quite a lot of gifts <laughs> including a couple that have passed into legend courtesy of events in the First World War and some recountings of sort of, of veterans of her crew thereafter so I guess what exactly were they for those who are unaware and how as it turns out did they possibly arrive aboard the ship Right. Well, uh, this, again, is an intriguing story. The um, ship was basically mobbed once it got to New Zealand. There's no other word for it. Um, they had opened ship at various uh, at the ports. They were working to a schedule, uh, which Halsey managed to uh, achieve. It had some modifications based on weather. 
they went to all of the major ports over an eight week period and something like a third of a million New Zealanders went on board the ship uh, in that time and another 125,000 at least got on small boats and sailed around and around it when it was in port. So, you know, it was simply extraordinary that the crew were treated like heroes. Um, there were dinners, there were sports matches, um, towns did themselves up. Um, the uh, town of Napier, for example, uh, put electricity on so that they could light up the, the Marine Parade uh, waterfront with electricity, and that was done specifically because HMS New Zealand was arriving, this sort of thing. It was quite extraordinary. Um, now, New Zealand, of course, was a colony. Um, the indigenous people here were Maori. And at the time, Maori also came on board, but um, there were various myths and legends about race relations, but Maori had been pretty well sidelined by the colony. Uh, were ruralised and fairly impoverished and had a treaty signed in 1840 guaranteeing various rights which successive governments had not actually honoured. And Maori knew this and had been agitating to get that support. Um, one of the bigger issues was loss of land um, and it happened in that first decade of the 20th century as HMS New Zealand was being, you know, the politics we were talking about earlier. Uh, there was a huge government land grab, massive amount of Maori owned land transferred to the Crown in that period, and, and it was quite uh, extraordinary. So there was a lot of political agitation, and um, groups of Maori who came aboard the ship inevitably used this as a device for raising political awareness. Um, the ship was a representation of Britain. It was a symbol of British power. The treaty was with the British. Uh, it was being administered by the New Zealand government and, and who was responsible for it. But Britain remained the, the executive um, and were engaged with politically. And so that the speeches that were given at the time by visiting Maori aboard inevitably referred to the Treaty of Waitangi Britain's obligations and the opportunity that the visit to the ship gave to express these points. Um, so it, it was intriguing because, of course, this was an age of um, racial attitudes were very different from today. It was we would call it embedded racism. Uh, New Zealand uh, settler society was in the middle of a massive cultural appropriation, in which they took the surface uh, accoutrements of Maori tanga, Maori culture and society uh, as their own, um, a, a quite different world from today. Um, now, one of the things that came up was that the responses of the crew on the ship to these visiting party of Maori were intriguing. Now, I'm mentioning all this as background to these two gifts. Um, there was a, a belief aboard, and again, founded in, in the you know, sort of uh, racism of the day, that uh, indigenous people were somehow savages or that they couldn't speak English and this sort of thing. And of course, Maori could all speak English perfectly well. They'd been able to do so for a century. You know, it was uh, well understood. And um, what was happening on board ship was that because of the formality of it, speeches were instead given in Te Reo Maori. Um, so from the viewpoint of HMS New Zealand, from the crew on board, most of whom were British, not New Zealand. There were New Zealanders aboard, about 50 of them, but most of the 800 odd were British. And so it engaged with beliefs of the day uh, without, and they didn't look beyond that. Um, now the gifts that were given, and there were many, many gifts, uh, were all symbolic. They were, uh, wrapped up in, again, the imperial, thanking Britain for its imperial protection and defence, which was a legitimate thing. They were wrapped up in the politics of the period. The British who received them, the officers and Halsey, didn't always record who had given them what. Um, there was a careful list made of the major gifts to the ship, including to the wardroom, 
uh, these came not just from Maori, but from the settlers. So there was silverware, there were mementos, there were knickknacks, all sorts of things were given, uh, including uh, Maori heitiki, which is a, a greenstone pendant. Um, and these didn't just come from Maori, they came from European settlers as well through this uh, cultural appropriation. So the two gifts in question that created the mythology was that uh, Halsey was given a uh, pew pew, which is a, a warrior's skirt, and it's, it looks like a kilt. Um, technically, it has much the same function, which is that it enables the wearer to, to move through pretty rugged terrain without ripping their clothing up and without hindrance. Um, essentially military garb. Um, and he was also given a heitiki. Now, it was never recorded. The heitiki is well known and recorded, and it came from as a loan, not a gift, from a Christchurch brewer named Sloman. Um, it's currently sitting in the Canterbury Museum because it was returned afterwards. Um, and this tiki became part of the mythology. The pew pew was never quite recorded when it was given, and there's a number of stories circulating, but the most plausible one, which I looked into, uh, was the ship was visited in Wellington Harbour by a parliamentary delegation of Maori, including Maori MPs, and including uh, Te Hiuhiu, who was a paramount chief from the Central North Island Taupo region. And it is likely that he was the donor of the pew pew. Now, the speeches given that day were recorded, and there is no mention of the garment protecting the ship, which of course is the mythology. Um, Halsey was told to wear it in battle. And of course, that's the function of what the garment was for. Um, at other times through the ship's tour of New Zealand, and, and there was a visit to New Plymouth particularly, uh, sorry, Whanganui, um, visiting Maori made prophecies about the future of the ship. And this was part of the symbolism that they were presenting um, and about potential battle damage and so forth. So what it would appear to be, the mythology that the, if the captain wore the pew pew and the Haitiki in battle, the ship would be protected from damage. It appears to be a lower deck conflation of what actually happened. And you can see why, because the, the general, as I said earlier, the general vision of indigenous people uh, wasn't quite on online, as it were. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of this protective um, garment and of the captain having to wear it in battle uh, and the crew made sure that he did there, there was uh, plenty of accounts of that um, it isn't pretty much uh, a, a royal navy superstition not something that was actually said at the time by maori so that's an interesting side there to the story yeah, I suppose, I suppose that but they probably interpreted battle as meaning the ship's going into action. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I suppose that with, with all the gifts, as you said, there's a few actual native New Zealanders aboard, but most of the crew is British. But with the gifts and with this kind of welcome that they've they've had in New Zealand, how strong was the ship and crew's connection to New Zealand in the aftermath of all of this? Well, the, the, the ship was pretty much adopted, um, you could say morally adopted by New Zealand, and uh, successive captains understood this and they accepted the moral adoption of the ship. So while it remained firmly Royal Navy, um, su uh, successive commanders went out of their way to keep the New Zealand government in the loop, um, to provide... Uh, special information or mementos or whatever. Um, you know, for example, after the Battle of Jutland, um, Captain Green, uh, the ship had uh, actually a reasonable amount of battle damage, including the jack staff, which had been shot through. 
Um, and he had the shot through part uh, carefully preserved on a, on a plinth and sent to New Zealand as a memento of their ship in the battle. Um, there were also uh, efforts made by the Admiralty to put as many New Zealanders as they could on board. So there were about 50 all up in the end, but it was a flowing, a, a sort of floating community because they came and went. Um, as, you know, just standard as the Navy circulated its crews. Yeah. So um, I guess so New Zealand is in New Zealand, <laughs> helpfully. And then what were the circumstances running up to World War One start to spiral out of control? And then, of course, World War One breaks out. So what happens to, to the ship when World War One breaks out? It, is it it's left in the Pacific, called back? sent over to the Mediterranean or something? Um, they returned They returned to Britain at the beginning of 1914, um, came back round South America, goodwill visits throughout the ABC states, um, went into the Caribbean. Halsey got involved uh, with a, convening a court-martial with uh, Rear Admiral Craddock, uh, of course, who was the uh, station commander, and uh, and of course we know what became of him a, a few mm. you know a little later. Um, they then sailed back via Canada to Portsmouth and rejoined the first battle cruiser squadron. Um, now carried on with working the ship up, exercises, all the usual things that go on in a peacetime fleet. However, um, they then went on a goodwill visit to Russia. Um, and uh, to Kronstadt, where uh, end of June 1914, and of course this was quite a specific time, um, hosted the Tsar. There was actually a party in which the Lion and New Zealand were uh, roped together. New Zealand provided the dance floor for a, a tremendous party that Admiral Beatty threw for the Tsar. And while they were in Kronstadt, there was this little problem of an assassination in Sarajevo. <laughs> now, nobody took too much notice of it on the ship. I, I had a look. Um, they then sailed back through the Baltic, back through to Portsmouth and back you know, to normal squadron duty. Their next job was the, uh, to assemble uh, as part of the combined fleet exercise that was going to be held that year, um, in which all of Britain's reserve fleets were mobilized and stood off the Isle of Wight in a uh, ceremony where they conducted various exercises and so on. And this had been long planned. Um, but of course, while it was happening, the, the European crisis continued to brew up uh, and as we know, they were they were still uh, pretty much there when the First World War broke out, and and Churchill and the Admiralty were then able to direct them to their war stations. So you know, for, for HMS New Zealand, it was returned to normal duty, um, hosting a party, uh, and then getting involved pretty much directly in the First World War uh, at that point. Okay, so. I guess, obviously, First World War, there's a number of naval actions. Um, New Zealand's involved in most of the ones that involve the battle cruisers, if not all. So how did the ship fare in battle? Um, and obviously, um, as we discussed, for various reasons, the crew have got it into their head that they need to have the uh, the uh, uh, Maori battle skirt being worn. So, so what happens? To, to, does it help? <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, it's almost certainly made no particular difference uh, to the fortunes of the ship. Um, the interesting part about the experiences of HMS New Zealand, it was in effect coincidental that she was in all of the major sea battles because, you know, ships were being pulled out all the time for occasional other duties uh, uh, or simply to go off for refit, um, that sort of thing. And... So 
was as much luck as anything else that she was involved in uh, the first Heligoland Bight, Dogger Bank, and then Jutland. Um, and she nearly missed Jutland because, of course, there'd been the collision uh, with HMAS Australia a month earlier, and she'd only come back from repair the day before. So, you know, it was just luck as much as anything else. But yes, she was in all the battles. Um, and didn't get particularly badly damaged, although the, the hit at Jutland on X turret uh, had potential uh, to cause problems had it started fires, for example, or anything else like that. Um, for me, the more interesting part is that the ship was fought uh, not as a battle cruiser necessarily, as none of these ships were actually fought on the basis of ship classification, but on the basis of engineering capability, which was something that the captains had to know about. So yes, they had a political classification as a battle cruiser or a dreadnought or whatever, uh, but what counted more was the, the engineering capability of the ship. Um, and for HMS New Zealand, the interesting part was that uh, she was able to keep up in battle pretty much with the Lion class and later battle cruisers. Um, and to do so fairly well. Um, and that really, I thought, was quite interesting because the getting up to 26, 27 knots is not an easy task for a ship of this sort because you've got these guys down below who are stoking. Um, there's going to be a limit to how fast and hard they can work and for how long. Um, so the fact that the ship, and certainly at Jutland, did everything that was asked of it, uh, with a couple of exceptions, um, is pretty much a testament to the capability of the crew, and in particular the stokers, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. in this case. Um, the points where the ship didn't quite manage to do what was wanted were to do with gun range. And um, there were various points in Jutland where the Lions were able to engage the German uh, battle cruisers and at various points the high seas fleet at ranges that HMS New Zealand couldn't. Um, so she was sitting there in line with her guns on full elevation down at the stops, uh, which didn't make fire control any easier, of course, because um, as soon as you're down at the stops, you can't adjust for roll. And so they were potting away every so often. They couldn't hit anything. The range was too great at these points. Um, for me, the more critical thing in all of these battles was that the ship didn't seem to hit anything. Um, fire control, she didn't have all the very latest fire control gear at the time. Um, some of it was actually fitted after Jutland, but there was enough there to, to, to work and to work reasonably. But the only hits that seemed to be made, there was one on uh, Blurcher during Dogger Bank, which was fairly decisive. It, it actually slowed Blurcher and did some pretty heavy damage to her. Um, but during Jutland, there's no evidence that the ship hit anything in particular at all until right at the end of the last engagement as the sun was setting, where at relative not too great a range, they engaged the German battle cruisers and then subsequently uh, the pre-dreadnoughts. And she seemed to have scored about four hits during that time. And that was it. Um, and uh, not a great testament to fire control, one has <laughs> to say. Um, but again, from an engineering perspective, uh, interesting points include the fact that one of her guns actually had split prior to Jutland and still fired nearly 100 rounds through it. So, you know, without anything coming adrift. So it was pretty good, really, in that sense. Yeah, that's uh, not something that you'd usually try and do if you value your continued existence. Yeah. Uh, firing with a split gun. But yeah, uh, I mean, well, she, she survived when um, the the class name ship Indefatigable exploded ahead of her at Jutland. So that, that's all obviously going to be positive for the morale of the ground. I suppose that kind of, as you say, with it, with the whole thing about the uh, the various um, artifacts being worn, supposedly protecting the ship, 
I suppose seeing that happen dead ahead of you and then you coming away with a hole in X turret and some shrapnel damage, it's probably going to create a self-reinforcing belief within the crew. Uh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Like, that, that's happened just ahead and obviously Qu uh, Queen Mary as well, but it's not happened to us. And as we are all human, everyone's going to go, well, why? <laughs> Tiger's yeah. been worked over. Lion's been worked over. Princess Royal's not quite as badly worked over. And then there's New Zealand going, well, we got a dent in the back turret. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, the, the, I looked at the uh, Queen Mary loss because, um, of course, New Zealand had to manoeuvre fairly hard to avoid the wreck. Mm. Um, and and, and the, the, the opinion within the ship, I, I looked at various accounts. Uh, yeah, they were absolutely horrified. And, of course, they knew people on board. There were people on Queen Mary who had been serving until just before on New Zealand. So, you know, it wasn't just the loss of a ship in battle. It was actually friends and colleagues that, that they knew personally. They, they were, you know, the ship had obviously blown up and was going down. Uh, and, and it was one hell of a shock for them uh, momentarily. And of course, they all reacted differently as, as people do. Um, but they carried on and did the job. Yeah, and so I suppose that, so it serves through World War One, sees a fair bit of action, um, survives obviously, so then what, what happens to New Zealand after the war? Well, by luck, in part, but also because uh, of the fact of her originally being a gift ship, um, she survived longer than, than some of the other ships. Um, you know, World War I ends, Britain's got a gigantic debt got a huge military expenditure. And so, of course, the first thing they did was decommission as much naval ordnance as they could. Um, and HMS New Zealand was set aside for special duty and became the home of Admiral Jellicoe on, uh, as his personal uh, transport and office uh, for his mission to advise on naval defence policy around four of the main dominions, including New Zealand. Um, and it was another thank you to New Zealand and another tour opportunity in New Zealand uh, for the ship. So the, there was a special cabin built um, adjacent to the starboard superstructure. Jellicoe came on board with his staff and, and off they went. So it was a second world tour um, throughout the whole of 1919. Um, and this at a time when, when, you know, the other 12-inch uh, Battle cruisers were being decommissioned, put in reserve, um, and of course New Zealand then returned to Portsmouth with Jellicoe on board. Um, I mention this because there's a, there's a very famous photograph which uh, shows uh, HMS New Zealand in Littleton Harbour in September 1919, and it's got these wonderful snow-clad hills. It's got the the little town, which is in a, a rather delightful valley, um, covered with snow, and this was an unseasonal snowfall uh, at the time. Marvellous picture, and I often see it uh, uh, referred to as this was bringing Jellicoe out to become Governor General of New Zealand. And the fact is, no, it wasn't. He went back to Britain. He came out later to become Governor General on board the Corinthic um, with his family and so forth. So HMS New Zealand ends up in any event in uh, early 1920, comes back to Britain and goes into reserve. And uh, there's, the fate of these ships is often looked as being tied up with the uh, Five Power uh, Treaty, usually known as the Washington Treaty that uh, shut down most of the fleets, restricted fleet sizes, cut battleship construction off and this sort of thing in 1922. Uh, but I looked at the uh, documentation uh, in terms of what was happening with New Zealand and the Admiralty were openly saying there is no chance of this ship being further employed. She's going to sit in reserve and then be scrapped. That's it. Um, and this was true of a lot of the other ships. Um, she was partly recommissioned as a tender, but, you know, essentially on death row. It was only a matter of time, which could have been years, you know, and... But then she was added to the list, as as were most of the other ships in the same position, 
for the 1922 treaty and uh, sold for scrap. Uh, 20,000 quid. <laughs> Bit of a poor rate of return. Yeah, well, actually, there was a funny outcome to that because the New Zealand, the Admiralty passed the money and back to the New Zealand government. And um, there's a sort of gleeful grins back in Wellington, you know. Oh, yes, we'll spend that on electricity. Uh, they were building an electricity network and they were going to throw the money into that. And uh, the, the audit office said, um, no, that has to come off the battle cruiser debt. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, and, and so the ship was scrapped and there were various mementos and things pulled off it. And uh, I think there were 23 cases of stuff sent back to New Zealand, um, some, including the laundry, I might add. Mm -hmm. um, some of it was put into the uh, naval base at Devonport, such as the laundry. Um, there was a very large sideboard in the officer's mess, which was accidentally sent out. Um, it was meant to go to the New Zealand High Commission in London, uh, accidentally packaged up and sent to Wellington. And then there was a fracas over who was going to pay for the shipping. And then what do we do with it? Um, and it ended up being put in the uh, parliamentary restaurant in, in Parliament buildings here, uh, where it uh, was served up meals for many years. Um, currently, I believe the Navy have it. They've restored it, and it's sitting uh, in Devonport, so uh, Auckland. So, you know, that really is, was the last of the ship. <laughs> Fair enough. So I suppose it's a, a, a relatively short life. I mean, not quite as short as, as some... Uh, ships of the Royal Navy at that period, but still, she's you know, she's a, she's a ship that's laid down in 1910, and by the early 1920s, she's gone to the scrapyard. Which, can, when you consider that a lot of the, well, she's going to the scrapyard at the same time as a lot of other ships that are may have maybe been in service five, ten, fifteen years longer. Um, but admittedly, you know, there are a few ships that have been in service three, four years each shorter, and they're going in the same way. So. Um, not not the world's longest lifespan, but certainly a lifespan that incorporated quite a lot of uh, interesting adventures and has obviously, as we've covered, spawned quite more than a few myths and legends, some positive and some not not so positive. But uh, obviously, if um, if people want to know more about the ship, because obviously we've only covered, you know, we've scratched the surface, we've covered in a, in, in a little bit of detail what's going on. Um, but if they want to know more, obviously, as you mentioned, there is a book. So would you like to tell people a little bit about uh, about that and uh, where they can find it? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Well, look, it's been published um, in the UK by Seaforth and in the US by the uh, United States Naval Institute Press. Available, uh, I believe the phrase is, all good bookshops uh, across the UK, across the United States. Um, you can buy it from Amazon um, directly, and uh, it's being released in New Zealand uh, also um, early next year, I believe. Mm -hmm. So widely available. Um, it's got a lot more detail than, than we've been able to put in here, of course. Um, a lot of numeric data, because I, I dug into the captain's ship's book which is held here in New Zealand, and it's an absolute treasure trove of original data about the ship. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll close on one tidbit, which I did include in the book. Um, during her trials off Polpero, which I, I see are often uh, listed in secondary material uh, as a particular speed that the ship achieved, um, According to the captain's ship's book, which has the original notes on it, um, the speed was measured simultaneously by two different methods and came up with two different numbers. So, you know, you can't really say <laughs> which one was the uh, correct one, as it were. Uh, and it just highlights the fact that, you know, history is always going to be a discussion. And uh, I'm hoping that my book has been able to contribute somewhat to that discussion uh, yes. in general about the ship. Oh, very definitely. I mean, I, I've 
um, in preparation for this, I, as I mentioned uh, offline before we started the interview, I've done a bit of a speed read of it, um, but I'm certainly going to be going back and uh, reading through it again in a little bit more detail when we don't when I don't have 24 hours to to go through and, and come up with a list of questions because of, of course time is sometimes of the essence so um, I guess we'll say thank you very much to to Matthew Wright uh, for coming in and lending us his expertise um, as mentioned you know go and have a, a look see if you can find the book in your uh, relevant applicable uh, bookshop online or offline um, and of course, I have to put in a little bit of a plug because if you are in the US and you're going to get it through the USNI uh, press, you can use the the code DRAC to get a little bit of a discount off. It's uh, not as much as you'll get if you are a member, um, but uh, it will still give you a fairly nice discount off of the RRP, which is uh, good for <laughs> good for the more economy minded of us. And um, yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure hopefully uh, at some point we'll talk again on another subject. <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to it. Look, thank you very much. All right. Well, see you around, everybody, and uh, see you in another video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.